Hello, I'm Jimbo Paris, and welcome to the Jimbo Paris Show. And today we have David, top author and speaker. He dropped about 50 pounds, about 25% of his body weight. And after accomplishing these things, he's now on a mission to help other people accomplish their own goals in weight loss and living better and higher value lives. How are you today? Doing great, Jimbo. Thank you for having me as a guest. Yeah. It's my privilege. So can you begin by giving me a brief summary about yourself, who you are, what you're about, and what your message is? Please, I want to know everything. Okay. Um, I'm a retired divorce attorney, and I'm a world-class expert at playing casino craps. So I wrote six books on that, and then I've written three novels. Two are published. And then I wrote uh, three books on weight loss. My third book will be coming out in November. And it's been uh, endorsed by Jack Canfield, co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. So I'm real excited about that. And as you mentioned, I lost 50 pounds. It started in July of 2016 when I went to see my doctor. And he said, based on my lab results and being significantly overweight, I had a 95% chance for a heart attack. Now, normally being in the 95 percentile is a good thing, unless it's a death sentence, then it's not so good. So during the next four months, I shed 50 pounds, 25 percent of my total body weight, and I've kept it off since then. So that's the important thing to remember about reducing weight. It's not just that you lose it. It's also to keep it off. So my mission is to help other people avoid having a heart attack or type 2 diabetes or other illnesses that they can do by improving their eating habits and reduce weight at the same time. And why is that your mission? What motivated you and charged you to pursue that and help others? Well, when I was younger, like most people, I was fit and trim and always healthy and into athletics. However, life gets in the way, you know, there's obligations with family, with uh, work. And before I knew it, I started exercising less than not exercising at all and stopping at fast food places, ordering pizzas, you know, picking up chicken to go and the weight crept up on me. And I went back after I lost the weight and started reading books from the seventies. I had about eating healthy by Paul and Patricia Bragg, Jack LaLanne, uh, Richard Simmons, William Duffy, who wrote uh, Sugar Blues. And then I started reading the books that are current out there on the market. Uh, what I realized is some of the current books by authors, they have misinformation or inaccurate information. And the books from the 70s are actually more accurate. And that's because a lot of the authors are promoting their own products or services or even programs. So the books are what I call a lead magnet for them. It's not to provide guidance and help for other people. So I want to help other people um, avoid the industry. The diet industry is, is designed to keep people failing. Diets are designed to fail. They're extreme. They're difficult to stick with. They're temporary. And a lot of them are potentially harmful. Uh, at any one time, there's 108 million Americans on a diet the average person will go through 156 diets during their lifetime. What that means for the audience is they don't work. So if you lost weight on a diet and gained it back, or you failed to lose weight on a diet, the diet's to blame. You're not to blame. So it's a lifestyle change. The way I explain it to people, it's similar to um, a sprint versus a marathon. The diet is the sprint. There's a goal. When you reach the finish line, you're done. And most people revert back to old eating habits. Where a marathon, you just keep running and that's your lifestyle. So the marathon, once you lose the weight, is to keep going and not stop. There's no finish line in the marathon. That's insane. So the diets that people go through can even be as close as the hundreds. Yes. And people always ask me, well, what's the best diet out there? And I tell them there is no best diet. The closest thing out there is not really a diet. It's the Mediterranean diet. And that's not a diet. It's a lifestyle. 
So when you read about Mediterranean eating habits, uh, yes, it's their dietary intake. However, it's more of a lifestyle. And what I try to teach people is don't think about your foregoing or sacrifice something. Uh, focus on the things you enjoy that are healthy for you. Uh, what you focus on expands. So instead of focusing on not being able to have the chocolate cake or the piece of candy or the ice cream, focus on the food you may like, like an apple or a banana or an orange. And by the way, orange juice is one of the worst things you can drink because it takes four to eight medium oranges to make one glass of orange juice. Yet most people wouldn't eat four to eight oranges at one sitting. Now you mentioned the Mediterranean system of eating. Why do you push that? And why do you believe that that's a strong system? Actually, I, I don't push it. Uh, I just tell people that's the lifestyle that seems to work for people. And because it, it eats natural food, you're not restricted. You're not ordering special meals or having to take a supplement or a special product. You're not having to make a special protein drink or buy someone's product to reduce weight and keep it off. Um, when you think of national brands where you have to order their special meals to lose the weight, well, what happens when you lose your weight and you stop ordering your meals? Unless you're taught how to improve your eating habits, then you revert back to your old habits. So in the new book that I've written, Break the Chains of Dieting, I've identified nine principles that people can apply or apply that are very simple. Um, little things like drink more water. And why should you drink more water? 75% of the U.S. adult population is chronically dehydrated, yet 71% of the U.S. population is overweight, of which 42% are clinically obese. So there's a direct correlation of not drinking enough water and being overweight. And what happens is when you're thirsty, sometimes people think they're hungry. So they actually eat instead of drink more. And then drinking soda, diet soda, or fruit juices, or fruit beverages um, actually causes weight gain. I have that argument with people all the time, especially with diet sodas. It's zero calories. How does it cause weight gain? Well, the reason it causes weight gain is because it has aspartame. And there are 92 known side effects for aspartame. One of them being that it creates, it increases your craving for sweetness. The other thing it does with aspartame, it blocks your body's ability to absorb vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. So your body goes into what they call starvation mode because you're not giving it the right fuel. You have to look at your body as a machine and it needs the right fuel to opt you know, for optimum performance. Most people feed their dogs and pets better than they do them, themselves. They take better care of their automobiles. They change the oil, take them for regular maintenance, yet they don't do that for their own bodies. So this is what I try to teach people. The other thing is our food portions have been supersized without us realizing it. In the 1900s, the average size dinner plate was nine inches in diameter. Today, it's 12 inches. In restaurants, a serving platter is between 12 and 15 inches. So what I tell people is when you go out for dinner, cut your portion in half, get a to-go box, and take half home. So you get two meals for the price of one. You're also saving money. And also in Europe, the average size uh, dinner plate is still nine inches. So little things like that. Also, eat slower. It takes our brain about 20 minutes to realize that our stomach is full. What happens is we're eating in a hurry. We're driving when we're eating, we're watching TV, we're eating at our desk, and we're not paying attention to what we're putting in our mouths. So we get distracted. So a lot of times you'll go through a bag of chips or pretzels or cookies while watching TV or doing another activity and not even realize it. You're looking, where did it go? You talked a lot about how different diets can or different systems and habits of eating can just impact the population as a whole but i'm interested to know what specifically what were the key things that you implemented in your life to lose weight and drop those 50 pounds and transform yourself the main thing is to drink more water because when you drink more water you tend to eat less it also helps with your digestive systems. It also has a lot of other benefits. And when I talk about water, I'm talking about pure water, 
not the fruit flavored waters or the sparkling waters. Uh, there's arguments as to what pure water really is. Uh, is it distilled water? Is it reverse osmosis? Is it spring water? And what I tell people is if you listen to one expert, they'll tell you one thing. If you listen to a second expert, they'll tell you another thing. And if you listen to a third expert, he'll tell you both of the other two are wrong. So when it comes to water, if you have a preference for distilled water or reverse osmosis or spring water, as long as it's pure spring water, then that's what you should drink. So Fiji water is a good water. Smart water is a good water. Reverse osmosis is a good water. Uh, distilled water is good. Um, the problem with the distilled water is it comes in plastic bottles, so it leaches some of the plastic chemicals, which defeats the purpose then. The other thing is when you're buying organic fruits and vegetables at the supermarket, what people don't realize is they're spraying the fruits and vegetables with water that's right out of the tap, you know, to keep them fresh. So again, it defeats the purpose of having organic. The other thing you do is I slow down my eating habits. I used to be a very fast eater. So now I put my fork or spoon be down between bites. I use a salad plate instead of a dinner size plate. Another thing I learned that I do is I get adequate sleep, at least seven to eight hours a night, because when you're sleep deprived, the average person will consume an extra 500 calories per day. And you need to reduce your caloric intake by 500 calories per day for seven days to reduce one pound. The other thing is I've learned to read nutritional fact labels on packaged products. And when you learn to read it correctly, it's more than just looking at the calories or the amount of sodium or the amount of protein or fats in it. Look at the ingredients. And a lot of times you'll see there's a lot of chemicals in there, uh, things you should avoid. Uh, it's not so much the food, it's what they've done to the food that causes the issues. And food now is toxic. It's full of chemicals that's highly processed and manufactured. What I mean by that is, it tastes good and it's been scientifically engineered to optimize your cravings for fat, salt, sugar, and texture. So you're never satisfied. And when they say you bitch can't eat just one potato chip, it's not a dare, it's a fact. And what happens is the food doesn't affect you right away. So if you took a poison, it would probably kill you right away. This food, it just builds up in your system and over time, uh, it accumulates. So after 20, 30, 40 years, that's when the illnesses start occurring. They're all preventable and reversible. The other thing that happens is, uh, for example, people who are over age 55, there's an 80% likelihood they're either a type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic. And if they're a pre-diabetic, within seven years, they'll be a, a type 2 diabetic. And that's because of all the bad food and junk food we've been put into our bodies that accumulate over time. The other thing is we're not physically active like we used to be. We're watching TVs. We don't even have to get up to change the channel. We can use the remote. And now you can even use the remote to just tell, you know, to change the channel through Siri or Alexa or whoever it is. Uh, so we become lazier and we need to be more physically active. Even if it's just walking around the block or, or just doing a little bit of uh, physical activity, get up out of the chair, from, you know, working, a lot of people are working from home now. So we're sitting more often, um, little things like that. And when you made this transformation, what motivated you to write your first book? And what did you want the book to focus on when it comes to helping people with their goals? I was attending Author 101 with Rick Frischman, and I had written a novel. And Mike Keening was on stage, and, and he says, I'm going to teach you how to write a book, and we're going to do it right now. So he said, write down 10 questions people ask you as an expert, and then write down 10 questions people should ask you, yet don't. So at the time, I was going through my weight loss transformation. However, being an expert in playing casino craps, I started writing down questions, and after 30 questions, I kind of threw my pen down and sat up and Mike saw me and he says, if you don't know what to write about, think about, or you're not an expert in anything, think about a life transformation. So I started writing questions about my weight loss journey, about what I was going through that I could help a person with. 
the next person that got up on stage starts out by saying they lost 100 pounds during the year and kept it off and, and were on their journey. So I talked to that person afterwards and said, I'm thinking about writing a book about my weight loss journey and helping others. What do you think? And he said, it was a great idea. So that's the first book was Discover Your Thinner Self. Uh, after I wrote that book, I realized I can do a better job. And then I wrote the second book, If Not Now, When, Reduce Weight, Create a Healthy Lifestyle. And I was fortunate to meet Dr. David Friedman, who wrote Food Sanity, and he became a mentor to me. Uh, he liked the second book so much that he wrote a little blurb for it. And then going through different things and in, in notes and in stories I had heard, not success stories about people who had lost weight, but stories about life lessons and fables and parables and myths. I thought, well, what if we apply some of those lessons to reducing weight and losing weight? So that's what I did. And that's how I came up with the third book. Uh, when I mentioned to a few people, they're like, why are you going to write a third book? And it's time, energy, money. I said, because I can teach people a different way to look at reducing weight and eating healthy than what's out there, more than what I've written. So it was important to me to convey lessons that are taught in these stories. For example, you've probably heard of the pot roast story. And if not, I'll, I'll give a brief version of it. Um, young lady's hosting a dinner party and she makes a pot roast uh, for her friends and they all enjoy it. And one of the guests says to the host, can I get the recipe? So the host writes it down and the guest looks it over and says, why do you cut the ends of the pot roast off when you you know, prepare it. And the host says, I don't know. It's how my mom taught me. So she calls her mom and says, mom, why do we cut the ends of the pot roast off after we, you know, before we prepare it? And she says, I don't know. It's how your grandmother taught me. Call your grandmother. She calls her grandmother and says, grandma, when you make your pot roast, why do you cut the ends of the uh, ends off? And the grandmother thought for a while and she says, oh, when I was married, the pot I had was too small to hold the pot roast, so I had to cut the ends off. So the lesson is we do things because that's how we're taught to do it without thinking why we're doing it or questioning it. We eat a certain way. We like certain things, yet we don't understand why we're doing it, but that's how we were taught, maybe from a family member, from friends, from colleagues. Uh, so I thought that was an important lesson, and that's one of the stories that we talk about. Uh, the other one is, you know, being a pilot on an airplane. If you fly from L.A. to New York or vice versa and you're off one degree, you'll end up 150 miles off course. Well, most of the planes are automatic pilot. During the trip, the automatic pilot is correcting its course about 87% of the time. So what I tell people on their weight loss journey is you're not going to be perfect. If you get off course, just keep correcting, just like an airplane does, you know, that's what people don't do. They get off course and they thought, oh, I'm done, instead of getting back on course and correcting. So you're always correcting. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not a food purist. Every once in a while, I like to have a piece of chocolate cake or pecan pie or pumpkin pie. However, instead of eating a large piece, I'll have a small slice. Or instead of eating a whole piece at one time, I'll eat it over three or four days and, and just eat smaller portions. So it's little things like that. So I'm not telling people they have to forego everything they enjoy, just certain things. Now, I look at food as a drug. Sugar is addicting. And, and so I will avoid certain things because I know once I start eating them, I won't stop. Much like an alcoholic should avoid having to drink, otherwise not unable to stop. It's just an addiction. Uh, for me, uh, Pringles potato chips, I'll go through a whole canister and still crave more. So I, I just won't start eating them. And you mentioned in society, we're just told to do things gradually. So why do you think American culture specifically, or just Western culture in general, tends to have a lot of these weight issues? Because an interesting thing you mentioned was a lot about the Mediterranean diet. And a lot of people in Eastern cultures especially the Japanese, are very naturally lean and slim. What do you think is going on there? Well, one of the differences between Western culture and the Eastern culture is family and sitting down and enjoying a meal together. So Dan Buettner talks about it in the Blue Zones, where their meals are done while they're socializing. 
uh, most of the Americans, to my knowledge, are eating their meals at the computer, watching TV, driving. They're, they're not having dinner at the same time like it used to be. Uh, the other thing is we're always in a hurry. We want things instantaneously. We're not willing to wait. So what I usually ask people is, would you like to weigh 24 to 48 pounds lighter by this time next year? And most people say, oh, of course. Okay, can you lose two, three, four pounds a month? Yes, that's doable. It's not a week, it's a month. Well, think of it this way. If you lost two, three, or four pounds a month for 12 consecutive months on average, in a year, that's 24 to 48 pounds. However, we see commercials on TV from national brands of losing 20, 30 pounds the first month guarantee. And people want the instantaneous results. They don't want to put forth the effort. The other thing is they give up too soon. Um, for example, people make a New Year's resolution and, and half the people that do that to lose weight stop after the first two weeks and about 90% stop after January 31st. And what happens is they think they need to go to the gym and exercise a lot to lose weight. And that's a fallacy. That's a myth. 100% of your weight loss can be determined by what you put into your mouth through eating and drinking. Uh, exercise is important for overall you know, fitness and overall health. However, it's not the way to reduce weight. And a good example of that is contestants on The Biggest Loser. 66% of them have regained all their weight, some even more. And the rest of them, very few have kept it off. So what I tell people is be patient. The other thing is the scale is a poor indicator for weight loss. And the reason I say that is I had a client who for three weeks was doing everything he was supposed to, and he was getting frustrated because the scale wasn't moving. So I asked him, I said, how do your clothes fit? And he goes, oh, my clothes are looser, and people are starting to notice I'm looking a little thinner. I said, are you exercising more? And he goes, yeah, I'm walking an extra five miles you know, each day and riding my bike more. I said, well, what's happening is you're replacing fat with muscle, and muscle and fat weigh the same. However, muscle takes up a lot less space. So even though the scale is moving, your clothes are a better indicator that you are being successful. And a couple of weeks later, the scale did start to drop and he was happy. What happens is people see the scale won't move after a week or two and they've been frustrated because they're saying, well, I'm doing everything. They have to give their body a chance to catch up or they'll shed eight to 10 pounds the first week and they think that's great. That's not sustainable. Your body needs to get the right fuel. Um, the other thing is our percentages of daily nutritional values is based on 2,000 calories per day. The average American will consume 3,600 calories per day, nearly double. Uh, to maintain or lose weight, you only need 1,250 to 1,750 calories per day, it, depending if you're a female or male or if you're physically active or not. Obviously, a pro athlete's going to meet more than you know 1750 calories per day or even people who exercise and work out a lot so that's what i tell people um a lot of people aren't even aware of how many calories they're consuming they'll go out to a restaurant and order a salad and a lot of these salads have a thousand to two thousand calories in them because of the extra things added the dressing the cheese the seeds the nuts you know, whatever else they put on it. So they don't realize they're eating more in one meal than they need to. Uh, the other thing is people are stopping at Starbucks. The foo-foo drinks, as I call them, um, the grande, not even the venti. A lot of them have 50 to 75 grams of sugar, and that's refined sugar in them. The average person for a female needs about 24 grams, and a male needs 36 grams of sugar per day. So a lot of these people are getting more sugar in one drink than they need for the whole day. And some people are having two or three of those a day. So it's little things like that that we can make adjustments to and improvements to. And when you do this, who do you think is the best client success story that you've had? Uh, best client success story is a high school class of mine. Of mine. Uh, she reached out to me because she wanted a signed copy of one of the novels that I had written. And she told me she was going to go on the cabbage soup diet. And I said, no, you're not. You're going to do my program. 
And so I started working with her and her goal was to lose 30 pounds. And after six months, she had dropped uh, 45 pounds because that's what her body allowed her to do. Uh, she just changed her eating habits. She started drinking more water. She gave up a lot of the fast foods, a lot of the snack foods, the junk food, and just started paying attention to what she was eating. Uh, so that was interesting. The other thing is we're being the same age. I'm talking about, you know, things that I'm going to do, such as my goal is to hike Mount Kilimanjaro next year. I've signed up for it. And my wife and I travel a lot. We had a condo down at Rocky Point, Mexico. And I'm telling her about hiking because I live near the White Tank Mountains in Arizona. Uh, and, and she is just telling me, she's like, man, you're planning all these things to do to live. And I'm planning on dying. And I said, well, you got to change your attitude. And so she said, yeah, I do need an attitude adjustment. And that's important. 80% of our thoughts each day are negative. Just imagine if we changed it to 80% being positive. So, you know, little attitude adjustment, some improvements in eating habits, drinking more water, and giving it time and being patient. And, and that's the secret to success is not giving up and, and just being persistent. What do you think is the most challenging obstacle when it comes to losing weight? The most challenging obstacle is just getting started. We all procrastinate. I tell people I did in four months what I could have done during the previous eight years. However, I used the excuse, I'll wait until Monday. I'll wait until after the holidays, when we get back from our vacation, um, after the company picnic, after we go to the restaurant with our, you know, for our favorite restaurant with some friends. Uh, or since most people gain the weight back, why even bother? Or it's too expensive or it's difficult to eat healthy. We all have reasons that we justify to prevent uh, starting. And then when we do start, we, we give up too, too early. Uh, Darren Hardy in his book, The Compound Effect, uh, talks about it's the small little things that is done consistently over a period of time that will give you noticeable results, both positive and negative. So if you do the things to give you the positive results and you give it enough time and you do it consistently, you'll get the results. And when you did this more and more, how did you evolve this system of helping clients into more of a dedicated business? And how did you market yourself in a way where you stood out compared to other diet systems? And I say diet in a way to say, you know, not really the real thing. How did you market it in a way to make it unique to yourself and your brand? What I did was tell people, if you want to lose weight, avoid going on a diet. It's not the way to do it. So you want to adjust your lifestyle and you can lose weight without going on a diet, without reducing calories or, you know, counting calories, without having to exercise. And people like that. They also like the fact they don't have to order any special meals or special products or supplements. Uh, so it's little things that they can make adjustments to. And what I tell people is... I am known as the overweight person's best friend because I can help them reduce the weight and keep it off in a healthy manner without going on a diet. The word diet has a negative connotation to it. In fact, Richard Simmons mentioned the word diet had the word die in it in his book. Uh, so that's how I distinguish myself is I teach you to enjoy things that you like. For example, not everybody, not one size fits all. Not everybody wants to eat dairy. Or likes dairy not everybody likes red meat not everybody likes fish not everybody wants poultry or eggs or other things so we find out what you do like that's healthy and that's what you focus on we find out that what you're eating that you shouldn't be eating so that you can reduce it and then eventually substitute and avoid eating it it's just making a, a choice we all make decisions and those decisions are choices and so we have the choice whether we want to eat the snickers bar or the hershey bar or drink the can of soda or not. The other thing is not all calories are equal. So for example, a Hershey bar has about 125 calories and a, a soda Coke has about hundred calories. Well, if you eat an apple, 
it has about 90 to 120 calories. However, it takes your body 25 calories to digest the apple. So it's a net of about 75 calories, where it takes your body no calories to digest a Hershey bar or a soda. So there's differences. Plus, there's no nutritional benefit in a Hershey bar or a, a Coke. Um, you can eat a pint of blueberries, and it's about 100 calories. It's got a lot of great nutritional benefits for you. It's hard to get, you know, eat too many of them. Same thing with, you know, cherries. It's great finger food because you have to eat them slowly because of the pit. Um, so little things like that. Uh, so we find out what people like, what they don't like, and we go there and make adjustments based on their, you know, personal preferences. Very good. And we'll get into exercise a little bit later, but until then, I have another question. How does the system work specifically when you're planning a regimen for clients? Now, I understand it's going to vary from client to client, but what is the textbook system where you throw different things into different pots and kind of categorize what they need? Well, the first thing we do is we teach them to drink more water and to give up the soda, the diet soda, the fruit juices, or start reducing it. So if you're drinking a can or two of Coke a day, can you drop it down to one or a half? Um, start increasing your water intake. What, what I found with one client, they thought they were drinking eight uh, bottles of water each day. However, they started going back to where they were working, which was outdoors, and they found half full bottles. So they weren't really drinking eight full bottles. It was eight eight half bottles. So little things like that, keep track and monitor. Uh, the other thing is we keep you accountable in a positive way. There's good ways to pe keep people accountable and then there's not so, so good ways. Uh, so we don't, we don't judge people. It's not a lecture. It's just, what did you say you were going to do? Did you do it? If not, what can you do to improve and do it next time? So little things like that. Um, we also teach people to reduce their portion sizes. Again, eat slower, use a salad plate instead of a dinner size plate, um, start doing positive affirmations, um, be persistent, and, and just be patient with it. As long as they would call in once a week and find out if they did what they say they're going to do, they get positive results. Uh, what happens is if they get off track, we tell them it's okay, don't beat yourself up, just get back on track. It's little things like that that makes a big difference. Uh, so you're not being judged. You're not being reprimanded. You're not being told you must eat this or you must do this. It's okay. What can you do that will be a solution to resolve the issue? Uh, if you're not looking at solutions, then you're, you got problems and we need to figure out how we can fix those problems. So we focus on solutions. Are you good? Let's get on to the exercise now. Okay. So what is your regimen for that? Do you have a certain type of philosophy and view similar to the one you discussed about eating habits and living a healthy eating style? Yes. Um, you know, I'm always asked what is what gym I go to or what my, you know, training habit is. And I don't go to the gym. As I mentioned, I'm blessed to be near the White Tank Mountains. And so I go hiking and I go maybe two or three times a week uh, when it's good, you know, when it's not conducive to go outside. I took a milk carton, put a little board on top. I turned it upside down, put a board on it so I can do steps on it, you know, step up 15 times on one leg and the other and just build up. I do push-ups. Um, so I built up to doing about 40 a day. I do maybe three or four times a week. So it's not every day. Uh, I started lifting dumbbells, light weights, you know, started with 10, 15 pounds for each arm and then built up to 25 pounds Do you know, maybe 10 reps of presses and five curls, do a couple sets of that. It takes about seven to 10 minutes and that's it. Um, other than that, you know, I get up a lot from my chair. Um, instead of keeping a jug of water at my desk, I get up to go to the pantry in the kitchen to, to get it. So I'm walking a little bit, just little physical activity. Uh, you don't have to do a lot to maintain, you know, shape. There's different levels of fitness. You know, if you wanna be a pro athlete, you have one level. If you just wanna maintain body tone, that's a different level. Um, 
so I'm not competing for Mr. Universe by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not putting hours and hours at the gym. In fact, by the time most people will drive to the gym, I'm done with my exercise routine. You can do squats at home. Um, there's a lot of great videos on YouTube that teach you how to do a proper squat, um, how to, you know, lift weights a certain way. Uh, it's inexpensive to, you know, get a set of dumbbells. You can get a milk crate for free at the grocery store if you just ask. Uh, so, again, you can walk around the block. Uh, you can do steps in your own house. You don't need a stair stepper. You don't need to spend four or $5,000 on these, you know, equipment. Uh, find an accountability partner, just someone to call and say, you know, all they got to ask you is, did you do what you said you were, were going to do? If not, what can we do to improve? You don't need to give excuses or reasons. Either you did it or didn't. And what will you do next week to make sure that you do it? It's so little things like that. And when you were continuing to pursue your fitness and health lifestyle did you ever grab anything do you ever think there's anything good to come out of any of these fad diets or are you sticking more towards the other side I'm what is your philosophy more, i'm sticking more to the other side and when we talk about fad diet i call fad stands for fat and desperate and, and again people are always chasing diets I was reading a book um, by Grant Cardone. He had a great line about success. And he says, it's your weight loss success is not losing the weight. It's keeping it off. So if you lost 20 or 30 pounds on a diet, but you gained 30 of it back during the next year, was that a success? Of course not. And again, diets are designed to fail. They're temporary. They're extreme. They're hard to stick with. And a lot of them are potentially dangerous. What they find out is the issues come up two, three years later when the person's been eating wrong, depriving their body of the right nutrition, the right, right minerals, the right, you know, fuel for it. Um, so it's important to maintain uh, an awareness. And when you talk about maintaining this awareness, how do you think you can maintain consistency when you finally reach your goal. What is the, how do you create that lifestyle, the new normal? Well, that's that's the way to reach the goal is creating the new lifestyle. So it's a lifestyle you enjoy. If you go on a diet and you're not enjoying it, you're not gonna stick with it. Uh, if you create a lifestyle that you enjoy, then you're gonna keep doing it. Uh, and that's what people are finding is, they like the new eating habits that they've established for themselves because it's eating habits that they like, they enjoy. Uh, again, they're not having to order special meals or restrict their dietary intake. Uh, they don't feel guilty if they have a piece of cake or a scoop of ice cream or a slice of pie. Uh, they know that, okay, they cheated, but it's, get back on course. Uh, they understand that a lot of processed and highly manufactured foods are not healthy for them. So they learn to eat, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables and berries and nuts and what they like. Some people are allergic to nuts, so they're not able to eat it. Um, one of the examples I use in the new book was based on Darren Hardy's analogy of what cheeseburger, uh, wine and wedding cake have in common. And so Let's say you're invited to a barbecue by a friend and they're serving this incredible hamburger from the best beef and, you know, specially made buns with all the favorite condiments and they offer you one. What are you going to do if you're, you know, wanting to reduce weight or a restricted diet? Well, if you're a vegetarian, you're going to say no, because you don't eat red meat. So it's not an option. So let's say you're at the same barbecue and it's a favorite wine is being offered to you by the host with the differences this time you're pregnant as a female so most women who are pregnant aren't going to drink because they know it's unhealthy for the baby so it's not that you won't drink the wine you don't drink the wine or alcohol so it's not an option same thing with the wedding cake you're at a special event for a wedding and world-class baker comes in to make the special cake and everybody's oohing and eyeing, and tasting and telling how great it is and they offer you a slice and you have to say no because it contained nuts 
and you're deathly allergic to nuts. So even a little taste could possibly kill you if not, you know, cause you harm. So it's not that you won't eat the cake, you just don't do it. And it's little things where you establish rules for yourself that you're just not going to cross those boundaries. You just don't do it. I've established some of those rules for myself. I just don't drink soda, period. I just won't eat a Hershey bar or a Snickers bar or candy, period. I won't eat Pringles potato chips, period. I've eliminated a lot of stuff that I used to eat regularly from my diet. I don't miss it, to be honest with you. I eat other things that I enjoy that's better and healthier. So that's what we teach people is focus on what you enjoy and not think about or dwell on the things that you're missing because you're not really missing it at that point. So it's a lifestyle that you can maintain because it's habits that you've created. Uh, the other thing is it takes about 266 repetitions or days to establish a new habit, not 30 days, not 21. They did a study in the UK and that's what they came up with on average. And again, it's on average. Sometimes it's shorter, sometimes it's longer. And what I tell people is good habits are hard to keep. Bad habits are hard to break. You just need to work on it. It's an effort. It, reducing weight and having a healthy lifestyle is not like getting a vaccine where you get a shot and you're done for life. It's constantly uh, doing it. And one of the quotes I, I use is that maintain a healthy lifestyle is the rent is due every day. You just have to pay the rent in the form of food and beverages that you drink and choose to eat. You you never own it. You're just leasing it. And when you do all of this, I I'm beginning to understand now why you were talking a lot about the positive affirmations and the mindset because. I think a lot of times people are okay saying I have the nut allergy because people are accepting of it. They're like, okay, he has another allergy. He can't eat that. That's okay. Or the woman's pregnant. They're like, okay, she's pregnant. That's understandable. But if you're doing something to better yourself and other people notice that and they get upset at you, it's important to be positive because you're doing what's best for you. So I, I really respect that because you create a sort of a synergy with everything. Well, exactly. And there are two stories I, I talk about in the book um, about frogs. And, and, or actually, one's about frogs and one's about crabs. Um, you put a crab in a bucket, it can crawl up by itself. You put several crabs in a bucket, they'll keep the other crab from getting out. They keep pulling you back down. Well, that's what your friends are doing to you if they're jealous or envious that you're successful. Um, I have a lot of clients that they tell me that their relatives or friends or colleagues are, are jealous and envious and they attempt to sabotage them and say, oh, just have one cookie or, you know, one piece of cake. It won't hurt you. It won't kill you. No, it won't hurt you and it won't kill you. However, it'll prevent you from losing the weight. Now, once you drop the weight and you want to have a treat once in a while, that's fine. But until you shed that weight, you need to make a decision on what's important to you. Uh, the other thing is the story, there are two frogs hopping through the forest and they fall into a deep well. The other frogs come upon them and they're telling them, oh, give up because you're not able to do it. It's too high. No frog can jump that high. And one of the frogs accepts his fate, lays down and gives up. The other frog, he keeps jumping and the frogs keep yelling. Finally, he jumps so high he was able to get out. And the frogs say, how did you do that? Didn't you hear us telling you it was impossible to do? You couldn't do it? And he says, oh, I'm deaf. I thought you were cheering me on. So again, it's a attitude, it's perception, it's being persistent and not listening to negative people. There are several books written out there about positive affirmations. And one of the authors talks about how he was reciting his positive affirmations to reduce weight. And after 30 days, he had lost you know, several pounds. And after a year, he had lost 30 pounds and kept it off. Well, what was happening is during that time, his wife was listening to him as he was, you know, reciting the affirmations while they were doing their, you know, routines. She lost 20 pounds during the same time and kept it off. So there is power in positive thinking and just reverse things and saying, oh, I shouldn't do this or I can't do this. Say, I am doing this to improve my eating habits. I am doing that to improve my health. Uh, just reverse it from a negative to a positive. So I give examples of how people can do that. 
it, it's not that I'm losing weight. I'm improving my eating habits to improve my health. Little things like that. It's just it makes a difference on how you approach things, what your perspective is, and, and the way your attitude is. Again, what you put out to the universe is what the universe is going to get back to you, and the universe rewards both positive and negative. So put out the positive energy. Put out the positive energy. And when you started to help more and more clients, was there any new information that you learned when you were teaching and helping other people? Yes, I learned that I can't help everybody. You have to make the decision that you want to be able to also help yourself, be willing to learn, be able to adapt and change and make improvements in your life. Um, when I was doing research for the second book, a friend of mine asked me, how many people would rather eat the junk food and suffer the consequences, even death, than give up their poor eating habits? I said, I don't know. So I started looking into it, and I was shocked that there are a lot of people that would really – rather suffer poor health and illnesses and even death than give up you know the food that is bad for them and it's not really food it's edible products a lot of it's you know full of chemicals and not made in nature so um there's an ad that chiffon margin ran in the 1970s um dina dietrich was the actress who played mother nature and she said it's not nice to fool mother nature well, perhaps we should heed those warnings. They're finding out now that people who are eating the imitation meats and chicken and fish with the chemicals, there's a lot of negative consequences that are starting to appear. Uh, again, those chemicals aren't designed in nature. They're man-made and you're basically putting a toxic into your body. So I tell people, watch what you're eating and, and be as close to nature as possible. Be natural as opposed to the artificial things. And every coach is going to have a different opinion on this when I bring them on my show. But do you prefer one on one coaching or do you prefer more group coaching? With weight loss, I prefer one on one. The reason being that weight is a very sensitive issue. A lot of people do not like being in a group setting. A lot of people do not like to share if they didn't accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. They don't want to share that they didn't do what they were going to do, that they cheated. Um, what I tell people, it's not what you eat while you're in public and people are watching. It's what you're eating and doing when people are not watching and you're by yourself. Uh, so I find that people can have more integrity if it's one-on-one -on -one because they feel comfortable um, being accountable and that way they don't feel that they're being judged. I'm not saying what I do is the best way. I'm saying it's just one way. And so whatever works for people that they're comfortable with, that's what's best for them. Uh, there are many ways to reduce weight um, in a healthy manner and keep it off. Uh, Susan Thompson Pierce has the Bright Line Eating. She wrote a book on it. And her way of doing it is extremely successful, very positive. And I implement some of the things that, you know, she teaches because it's so well done. So there's a lot of different um, places people can go to get the knowledge. And it's just not having the knowledge. It's implementing it and then being accountable and taking action and doing it. Uh, so... Again, uh, there's a lot of different ways to do things. What I do steer people against is fad diets. Uh, if they have to order special supplements or special meals, I encourage them not to. Uh, I have a, a relative who's been on a national brand's eating for about 40 years. That's all she eats. That's not living. And those foods... They're full of chemicals. They're not the healthiest foods for you. Uh, they're processed. That's how they can deliver them to your home. That's how they can keep them frozen. And then you heat them up in a microwave. So, you know, everybody has their own way of doing things. If, if she's comfortable with it, that's fine. If I'm going to help somebody, I'm going to encourage them to avoid those things. 
and, and find out what they can do to cook a meal. You know, if they're running short at, at breakfast time, you know, you can keep hard boiled eggs in the refrigerator. If you don't like eggs, maybe you like an avocado, cut it open, and just eat it right out of the shell. That's what I do. Um, if you like tuna fish, you know, I just eat the tuna right out of the can, uh, make sure it's packed in water instead of oil. It's interesting about tuna because the can actually has two servings instead of one. So you have to double all the nutritional values on the label. The other thing is with tuna, it'll say on the front label packed in water, but if you read the ingredients, it'll say tuna, water, salt, or vegetable broth. Well, what's in that vegetable broth? It can be up to 168 different compounds in the vegetable broth. The only two brands that I found that do not have, you know, vegetable broth and says tuna and water or sometimes sea salt is uh, the Costco brand for, you know, Kirlin or uh, some of the chicken of the sea that sold at Costco and also the uh, wild plant of tuna. So you have to be able to read the ingredients and see what's in there. Um, what's interesting is the marketing people for food products such as spaghetti, they understand consumers are becoming more educated. So on a box of spaghetti on the front, it'll say zero grams of fat, zero sodium, this much protein. What they fail to mention is it's 46 grams of carbohydrates and it's simple carbohydrates. So it's not healthy for you. Of course, they don't promote that. So you pick it up, you read just the front label and you think, oh, this is good for me. It's it's not. So again, be careful what you're eating. Read labels. Very interesting. And concerning your business, what types, what are the key products and services that people want to get from you? What sort of offers and things do you provide? So kind of Go into the specific books, your website. This is sort of the point where I kind of want you to really show people what you have because okay. this is all great stuff. Well, thank you. Um, they can go to my website, which is The Health Maestro, and Maestro is spelled M-A-E-S-T-R-O.com. So T-H-E-H-E-A-L-T-H-M-A-E-S-T-R-O.com, The Health Maestro. And there is free booklets, uh, Five Common Sense to Healthy Weight Loss, and there's a second one out there. You don't even need to provide your email to obtain it. There's no opt-in. That's just something I want to provide to people uh, so they start getting some information. Also, I post blogs on there on a regular basis, and there's a lot of great information. A lot of things we talked about are, are there on the blog. Uh, they can get my book. If not now, when reduce weight in a healthy manner at Barnes and Noble or Amazon or independent bookstores, some libraries may carry it. If your library doesn't, you can ask them to order it. Uh, my forthcoming book, uh, Break the Chains of Dieting, will be released in November. I would highly recommend that because uh, it's different. There's nothing out there like it. Um, teaching lessons from other stories and not just people's success stories, but life lessons. So uh, they can reach me that way. They can reach out and send me an email. They can contact me through the website or they can send it to my uh, private email, which is David Medansky. And my last name is spelled like three words, me, Dan, and Sky. It just sounds Polish. So they can send it to davidmedansky at gmail.com. Uh, I'm always happy to answer emails and respond to people. Um, I won't try to upsell you or put you in the program. I just want to help as many people as possible because I'm just upset with the food industry and big pharma taking advantage of people. And to me, I believe they're in cahoots together because uh, food industry creates the problems and big pharma uh, keeps the people on their drugs and, and doesn't look for the solution. So I want to help people get healthier, have more vitality, feel better, look better, and just enjoy life like I am. That, that's what it's about. Speaking of enjoying life, what do you think is the key solution you have in creating true and honest health and, you know, fitness books 
compared to you know these other groups with these fad diets connected with big pharma how do you create that sort of egalitarian and pure system of health what is your solution well my solution is to change one, the future one of my one of my thing is i don't promote products or certain programs um, it, i i give people not only what to do also how to do it a lot of books will tell you what to do what they fail to give you is how to do it so they will tell you drink more water well how can i drink more water what can i do to improve it so i tell people look when you first get up in the morning drink a glass of water eight ounces to 16 ounces and hydrate yourself because most of the time you're dehydrated um, drink a glass of water before breakfast drink a glass of water at lunch or mid-morning you know one in the afternoon keep track little things like that so i'm telling you how to do it as opposed to just drink more water um, when i tell you to reduce portion sizes i tell you what to do to reduce portion sizes as opposed to not just using a smaller plate what else you can do to slow down your eating uh, i give examples and, and solutions because everybody's different and everybody has different lifestyles different environments and, and so that's what we go into is what is your environment that's causing you to have bad habits and what can we do to improve your environment to increase, you know, improve the, the good habits, uh, little things like that. Um, so that's a big factor for me is, is providing the information. Uh, if I can give someone a book and it can change or save their life, I'm happy. I don't need to sell them a program and make more money from them when they can do it themselves. I'm happy to be there of service if they need it. I also tell them in this third book what they need to do to get an accountability partner and have the accountability calls. So it's how to do it and how it should be performed. In fact, you don't even need somebody who's losing weight or even knows how to lose weight. All they need to do is ask you, did you do what you said you're going to do? If not, what can you do to improve so that you can accomplish it the next time? Simple little things like that. And uh, one more thing I'd like to add, I provide in the second and third book, a code of honor. Most food books, health books, diet books don't have a code of honor, but it's important to have a code of honor. The military has a code of honor and it's very important. A lot of sports teams, they have their own little code of honor. A lot of companies have a code of honor. So I teach you how to create your own code of honor. So. It's stuff that you agree to, and that's what you're going to do. And what are the key points in your code of honor? Integrity. Um, if you say you're going to do something, do it. Um, eating healthy, uh, you know, avoiding processed food and manufactured foods, saying no. I have a little, you know, saying you know, more for you when someone offers it to me and I don't want to eat it or shouldn't eat it, you know, or better in the trash than on my ass. So I try to throw some humor into it. Uh, one of the things I do um, when I'm at a restaurant, I can go into any restaurant and not look at a menu and still place an order because all I use is the magic words. I'm on a restricted diet. It doesn't say why I'm on a restricted diet. It just says I'm on a restricted diet. I like to order, you know, either grilled fish or a piece of chicken or, you know, a filet or whatever, and broccoli or asparagus or green beans. And 100% of the time, if I ask for a special request, they always make it because they always have something they can put together for you. I heard a story about Jack Lane that when he went to restaurants, he would just tell the, the waiter, uh, go back and tell the cook or the chef to get nine separate, you know, vegetables and, and berries and throw it together and bring out some, you know, this and that for a dressing. And, and that's what he would eat. So whatever they would have, you know, throw it together. Um, a lot of my salads, I don't use salad dressing. I, I like to throw some avocado in there, fresh blueberries or blackberries or raspberries or all three. Sometimes I like to throw in, you know, spinach, uh, maybe some grilled chicken or, or something as a protein. Uh, before you know it, it's, it's filling. You can throw some sliced apples in there, chop walnuts, uh, chopped almonds, whatever you prefer. Uh, so there's things you can do to be creative and it's inexpensive.
And are there any sort of ending and closing statements, some final words you would like to let the audience know and let everyone know? Uh, just take the knowledge that I've provided to you and start acting. Do as much research as you can. Learn to read nutritional fact labels. Be wary of what is being told to you on the front of the package as opposed to the ingredients. Uh, question everything. Uh, question why you do certain things or eat certain things and, and maybe find out what you can do. And again, focus on what you enjoy to eat that's healthy for you. So focus on the positive stuff and drink more water. I always tell people drink more water because that's the number one key to maintaining good health and reducing weight and keeping it off. Excellent. I'm Jimbo Paris, and this is the Jimbo Paris Show. Thank you again, sir. Really appreciate it, David. Thank you, Jimbo. I appreciate it being a guest.